I knew that he was going to start showing clips of zombie movies. I mean, Dr. William Lane Craig and I are in an extended response series about how many people in history came back to life who wouldn't think about Rick Grimes and his crew. But unlike The Walking Dead, I'm going to attempt to wrap this series on a high note. Here it comes. Welcome to Apologia, where a former Christian takes a look at the claims of Christians. In particular today, this series of back and forths between myself and well-known Christian apologist Dr. William Lane Craig. If you're new to the channel and you want to be notified when Dr. Craig adds his next link to this chain of replies we're having with each other, tap on the subscribe button for my latest theology, science, and news videos. If you've been following this series, you'll know that this is my third of three responses to Dr. Craig's two-part response to my one-part response to his animated video about the supposed proof of the resurrection of Jesus. You don't need to know any of that now, but there are links in the description for when you want to catch up on the whole conversation, some of which I'll summarize rather than replay directly for the sake of your time. Continuing. When they heard the report that the tomb was found empty, they said that Jesus' followers had stolen his body. Not only is this alleged response by Jewish authorities completely and entirely, for the Bible tells me so, it's not even one of the details attested in multiple Gospels, like the kind Craig thinks we should have confidence in. Again, the critic shows that he hasn't read what I've written on this and what is merely summarized in the video. This is the same charge he made in part one, that because I address exactly and specifically what is said in his video, that I must not have read his more detailed works. But I'll reiterate again that the videos themselves give no hint or clue that further background reading is suggested or required in order to clarify the claims made in the videos. Craig's animated videos make the most aggressive, most favorable versions of claims that the Ninth Commandment will allow leaving his mass audience walking away with a false sense of confidence as Craig knows full well they won't bother reading the background material and instead proceed merely on Craig's authority. Then, if someone like me challenges and demonstrates his overstepping and misleading phraseology, he walks back these overreaches with the excuse that the lack of accuracy and nuance is because his video is merely a summary. Matthew is the only one who has the guard at the tomb story, but this is not a Matthean invention or creation. Matthew's narrative is filled with non-Matthean vocabulary, which indicates that he's passing on a prior tradition. Or that this section was added later by someone other than the original author. The argument here is not for the historicity of the guard at the tomb. Rather, the argument is that there was a anti-Christian polemic by the Jewish authorities which alleged that the disciples came and stole the body away at night while the guards slept. And Matthew is exercised to try to refute this widespread Jewish counter-explanation of the resurrection. It doesn't matter if the guard is fictional or not. The point is that this was the story that was being told at the time that Matthew wrote in which he wants to refute. Do you hear that, Christians? Dr. William Lane Craig says it doesn't matter if the story of the guard is fictional or not. The author of Matthew was faced with a counter-explanation for the resurrection and was therefore tasked to refute it, even if that meant he had to invent a non-historical event to do it. This is quite the slippery slope. If the Bible has one story manufactured to cover an objection, why not more? What if the character of Joseph of Arimathea and his lending of a tomb was an invention to address the objection that Isaiah 53.9 prophesied that the suffering servant would be buried with the rich, but historical Jesus was instead thrown into the same mass grave that most crucifixion victims landed in? Why should we accept that the guard story is a fictional response to an objection, but not entertain the idea that other details are equally manufactured for narrative purpose? And what this story implies is that the body was missing. No, what this implies is that the idea that the body was missing was a widespread rumor or belief. Just as Craig says the author of Matthew chose to relay an invented story in order to counter an active Jewish claim, so too the stolen body hypothesis may well have emerged entirely to counter the empty tomb claim. It speaks to the existence of the empty tomb claim, not to the veracity of the empty tomb claim. The, the Jewish polemic did not say that the body is there in the tomb and remains to be seen. Which would be entirely consistent with a scenario where Jesus' body was thrown unceremoniously into a mass grave, the usual fate for a crucifixion victim, at a location entirely unnoticed by anyone. They couldn't have gone back to dig him up if they'd wanted to. The disciples may well have taken advantage of this lack of record keeping to bolster their claim. So that the earliest attempts to counter the preaching of the resurrection 
itself or themselves presupposed that the body was missing. As the Jews would have had even less information on the location of Jesus' body than the Romans had, and they were simply looking to combat an empty tomb rumor, they put forth a plausible, reasonable, sufficient, natural counter-explanation for the alleged stories. This is not about the historicity of the guard. Again, Christians, notice that scholar William Lane Craig is not defending the historicity of this Bible story, since he has no intellectually honest way of doing so. Good for him for not compromising on this. Christians, you should follow his lead. And certainly not about the historicity of the resurrection of the saints that is recorded in this earlier uh, pericope. He mentions the so-called resurrection of the saints because in an attempt to illustrate that there are portions of the gospel that Craig does not affirm to be historical, I played this clip about the Matthew 27 story of many dead rising and wandering around Jerusalem. This would be part of the typical sort of apocalyptic symbolism to show the earth-shattering nature of the resurrection and the need to be taken historically, literally. Let me just say, with respect to that, I did not affirm that this was non-historical. I said that that's a possible interpretation, that you could take this to be part of the apocalyptic imagery of Matthew, um, and that would be a legitimate um, explanation. If hyperbolic, non-literal interpretations of gospel passages are legitimate explanations, how can Craig insist on an empty tomb as a historical fact when it is recorded only in the pages of these same gospels? It seems like special pleading. Even if you regarded this as non-historical, notice that that story of the resurrection of the saints is not attached to the resurrection narratives of Jesus. It's part of the crucifixion narrative in Matthew. And nobody thinks that that would therefore lead you to deny the historicity of Jesus' crucifixion. When you've admitted that the Gospels include non-historical narratives, then you have to open up the possibility that other portions are non-historical as well. The two stories we've been talking to that Craig acknowledges may not be historical, the resurrection of the saints and the guards at the tomb, are both in Matthew 27. The resurrection of Jesus is in Matthew 28. It's not only the very next chapter, it's actually the very next verse. There were no chapter divisions when these books were written. We're supposed to be able to tell that in the course of a single verse, the author went from a made-up fictional polemic back to solid history? Jesus' crucifixion is an indisputable fact of history, even if Matthew appends to the story of Jesus' crucifixion this account of the resurrection of various saints. Historians who affirm Jesus' crucifixion generally do so upon secular sources Josephus and Tacitus not on the say-so of the Gospels. If there were even a single extra-biblical source for this alleged empty tomb, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So this is simply irrelevant to the question that we're considering whether or not there's good evidence that Jesus' tomb was found empty. The Jerusalem zombies are a bit of a non sequitur, but serve as a demonstration of Craig's somewhat arbitrary evaluation criteria for determining which Bible verses are invented and which are historical. Some Christians may be surprised to learn that a man like Craig acknowledges gospel inventions at all. Bill, can you say something about uh, this allegation that if uh, a significant event had occurred at this time, yeah. that all the historians would have... Uh... An argument from silence is when one attempts to point to an absence of evidence as evidence of absence. An informal fallacy, particularly when used as the crux of an argument. However, just as it would be appropriate for me to indicate any historical sources that supported the Bible's claim, it's equally appropriate for me to indicate that a thorough search of supporting evidence has come up empty as a record of research results, not as an attempted proof. Yeah, I would simply ask our critic, what historians is he talking about? Who, who does he think should have recorded such an account? Uh, I don't know. Josephus? There's no reason to think. Josephus wrote about all kinds of mundane details about life in Jerusalem during the time of Jesus. There would be no reason to require that he would record these resurrections. But as one example, Josephus takes the time to give us a section on sandal replacement practices for posterity. So it seems reasonable that if he'd known about a gang of formerly dead wandering around Jerusalem, that he'd have spared a few sentences of his 20 plus volumes of history to let us know. I've heard this question of which historians might write from several apologists, including Eric Hovind, as I covered in my Secular Sources for Jesus video, as if it's a gotcha question of some kind. And perhaps it often is, since few people can list off any first century historians off the top of their head. But there were plenty of historians writing about the period and locations of the New Testament. Early church father Eusebius claimed that historian Philo of Alexandria actually knew Peter, yet said nothing about Jesus in his writings. There's Apollonius of Tiana, Seneca the Younger, Pliny the Elder, Justice of Tiberius, Dio Chrysostom, and on and on. 
for some of these conspicuous absences. We know of them specifically because early church fathers like Eusebius and Photius of Constantinople were already trying to explain this unexpected historical silence thousands of years ago. There's no reason to think that if following Jesus' resurrection, various people in the city claim to have visions or appearances of Old Testament saints, that this would be somehow recorded somewhere. Visions or appearances, says Craig. Matthew 27, 52 says, The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. It says specifically that the bodies were raised to life, but Craig is quick to relabel this clearly intended as physical phenomenon as visions or appearances. Experiences that needn't have been physical. This is the opposite of the usual Christian conflating the Apostle Paul's vision with the physical appearance. If Craig suggests that these concepts can be used interchangeably in the New Testament, then why would we insist that any of the post-death Jesus sightings were real? In fact, I, I don't find it all implausible that there would have been, say, a chain reaction of such sightings following the resurrection of Jesus. A chain reaction of non-physical sightings of the dead that may not be historical. A reminder that he's not talking about Jesus, we assume. So I don't think we can be confident that these sort of appearances didn't occur uh, in Jerusalem at that time. Uh, they're not like the cartoon here of dead zombies, yeah. you know, roaming about the streets of Jerusalem. I hope our listeners are more sophisticated than that. We would be talking here about uh, appearances of glorified persons um, uh, to various individuals. Why would we necessarily be talking about glorified persons? What about the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life in any way indicates glorified persons? Is Craig inferring merely non-physical visions to select individuals rather than actual reanimating corpses? If he can justify interpreting Matthew 27 resurrections this way, why can't we also interpret the Matthew 28 resurrection of Jesus as equally non-physical visions? These are dangerous justifications Craig is making, setting what should be troubling precedents for any Christian listening. Here's toward the end of his segment on the empty tomb. Most scholars by far hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. It was in William Lane Craig's own book, Reasonable Faith, Christian Truth and Apologetics, that I found Kremer's comment. By far, most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Why did the video deliberately change exegete to scholar? What is an exegete? It's someone whose job it is to interpret scripture. This is just embarrassing for the critic, uh, Kevin. This is so embarrassing for me. Let me adjust my face accordingly. It shows that he doesn't understand what biblical exegesis is. Um, biblical exegesis is not starting off believing that it's true and then trying to explain what the Bible says. I'm sorry for being so misguided as to suggest that exegesis involves coming to conclusions by using the biblical text. Maybe the Christian Ministry Channel got questions can correct me on this. The word exegesis literally means to lead out of. That means that the interpreter is led to his conclusion by following the text. Hmm. Maybe my Bible college education is serving me after all. These are technical terms used within seminary circles. Exegesis is specifically about internal theological interpretation and is specifically separate from the practice of textual criticism, which is investigation of the history and historicity of a text. Exegesis is to history as astrology is to astronomy. Rather, uh, biblical uh, exegetes are precisely these historical scholars who investigate the New Testament and try to figure out its meaning and, and what it says. Correct. Exegetes are trying to find meaning in the words, not determine how the words came to be. So far we agree, Dr. Craig. And the um, quotation from Kramer, if he looks at the footnote in Reasonable Faith, is in German. I made the graphical choice of wanting to clearly compare the quote in Craig's video to the quote in Craig's book, so I can forgive Craig for wondering if I indeed read footnote 54, even though it's clearly delineated on the screen. And in fact, I did read the footnotes and assumed that Die Osterreffengelien was probably a German language book, though such is not specified. And it was I who translated the word in the German exegeten as either exegetes, or since most lay people don't know what that is, scholars. Yeah, you've just admitted to exactly what my complaint was. Your imprecise language which has the consequence, intended or unintended, of misleading your video audience. It is a matter of communicating to lay people what Kramer was talking about. So in Reasonable Faith, which is a, a somewhat more scholarly, I give a more literalistic translation of exegeten as exegetes, 
but in, I think, probably on guard or in, in a video like this for lay people, um, just translate the word as scholars. You chose not to use the general word scholar in your book, as those readers would know it was inaccurate to the point of being incorrect. An exegete is absolutely not synonymous with scholar. It is a specific type of scholar. A pediatrician is a specific type of doctor, one who treats children. It is very obviously different to claim that 75% of pediatricians give lollipops to their patients, as it would be to claim that 75% of all doctors give lollipops to their patients. You can't extrapolate statistics from the specific to the general. This imprecise language gives the impression of far more agreement than exists in reality. Sure, most exegetes consider the biblical statements about the empty tomb to be reliable. The majority of all scholars? Not a chance. But if you just watch the video, you're led to think so. Okay. In the video, I noted that one of Craig's sources, Jesus resurrection expert Gary Habermas, explicitly refuses to call the empty tomb a historical fact. I don't take what Habermas calls a minimal facts approach to the historical Jesus. For Habermas, for something to be what he calls a minimal fact, that's a, a technical term for Habermas, virtually everybody has to agree that it is historical. But what Habermas's own survey show, as I point out, is that around 75% of the scholars that he surveys in the literature written on this topic agree with the historicity of the empty tomb. This will never be impressive until such time as Habermas publishes the survey. It is said to be those who have specifically published on the resurrection of Jesus, which would be a massively self-selecting group of Christians. Frankly, it is more startling that 25% of a group do not attest to the empty tomb, which is probably why Habermas won't stake his scholarly reputation on overstating the historical case for the empty tomb the way Craig does so freely. And that is exactly what Kramer says. By far, most exegetes hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. So Kramer is on exactly the same ground as Habermas. By far, most scholars, uh, somewhere around 75%, uh, agree with the historicity of the empty tomb. And so there, there's no uh, inconsistency here whatsoever. You're doing it again, conflating exegetes, those who interpret the theological meaning of the biblical text, rather than those who study the history and historicity of the text, with general scholarship. I'd love to know what percent of general historians in the world accept the historicity of the empty tomb. Maybe someone will actually do that study one day, rather than just imply that it has been done. What about Gary's quote there, that he doesn't use the empty tomb as part of his minimal right, facts? Right, because the empty tomb is not agreed to by, say, 99% of scholars, so Gary doesn't use it, and I think that's a mistake. Gary is the one who did the research firsthand, and his whole career is advocating for the resurrection. And you think he's making a mistake. You sound like the young earth creationists who say that Dr. Mary Schweitzer, the scientist and devout Christian who discovered the so-called soft tissue in dinosaurs, should be second-guessed about the age of soft tissue in dinosaurs. When the primary experts in a field are on your own team, maybe you should listen to them when they say you're making bad arguments. I don't see any reason to deny well-attested historical facts about Jesus when we're trying to figure out what happened to Jesus after the crucifixion. When it comes to the empty tomb, we're not talking about well-attested. We're talking entirely about for the Bible tells me so. This isn't an appeal to authority. It's simply to say that contrary to uh, apologetics here... Checking the podcast transcript on the Reasonable Faith website, when Craig says apologetics here, he means me, apologia. Given everything else I've been called lately, I'm going to take this as a win. That the majority, the wide majority of New Testament historians have found the evidence that I summarize here to be convincing. The wide majority of New Testament historians work for institutions that require them to sign statements of faith. They would explicitly lose their jobs if they admitted to not finding the evidence convincing. For example, Craig's employer, Biola University, holds itself to these articles of faith, including the predetermined conclusions that the Bible is without error or defect of any kind, and that God raised from the dead the body that had been nailed to the cross. Does this sound like Craig or his colleagues are free to follow the resurrection evidence wherever it leads them? Why would we be impressed that the majority of people whose employment requires belief in the Jesus resurrection claim are convinced of the Jesus resurrection claim? If I learned that 75% of Apple Store employees would recommend the iPhone, I wouldn't be impressed. I'd wonder why the percentage is so low. Not so with Craig. We can say this in summation, that this 
animated video that Reasonable Faith has produced has certainly already began to garner response. You know what would generate even more response? if you allowed comments on your videos. And people uh, viewing it and checking it out on YouTube. Yes, and for that, I'm very grateful. Well, it seems the Reasonable Faith podcast has moved on to other topics, with no future installment in sight on the other two-thirds of the so-called facts presented in Craig's original video, the appearances and the apostles' belief. If you're curious about my take on Craig's arguments, why not check out my video that started this all off, How Not to Defend the Resurrection of Jesus with William Lane Craig. Even if Dr. Craig is done with me, I'm certainly not done with him. So tap subscribe so you don't miss any of these future conversations. Until next time, later.